Hello and welcome to the all new Marvel Roundup, the Southgate Media Group's Guide to the Marvel Comics of the Week, part of the Channel, f not channel 52, all oh, the Enough Said podcast. I am Phil Parrish with too many podcasts that I get very confused in my old age and with me as always is... Charlie Esser. All right. Uh, you know, Charlie, we cover... A podcast. What? <laughs> What? Got to prevent the confusion, man. We're all getting old. I know. I hear you. Uh, so, Charlie, we cover a lot of books here, but believe it or not, we don't cover all the Marvel books. But Not by a lot, Luckily, we have a uh, loyal listener, Stockton Piner, who writes to us from time to time. Uh, and this week, he wrote to us about the Thanos book. Uh, he writes, Hello again, Phil and Charlie. I wanted to write in to discuss Thanos by Jeff Lemire and Mike Dio, Dio, well, how do you say that? Dio, Dudato. <laughs> this has been a compelling series through the first four issues. Issue two ended with the Shi'ar Imperial Guard surprising Thanos after he murdered his father, Mentor. The third issue is the battle that ensues when they attempt to apprehend the Mad Titan. We see wave after wave of Shi'ar hit him with everything they have until he is finally brought down by Gladiator. Issue 3 is a pretty straightforward battle scene, so I really don't have much to say other than this Mike Diado guy might have a future as an artist. Thanos 4 is my favorite issue of this series to date. It begins 8 months ago with Thane annihilating Corvus Glaive's army in the Black Quadrant. Ebony Maw encourages him in the slaughter as he attempts to claim his birthright. Then Corvus Glaive shows up with the Sisters of the Astral Coven. The Sisters steal Thane's power while Corvus... Bess, Ebony Maw in single combat, and Thane is left to rot in a dungeon. Cut to seven months ago, Thane is moping in a cell until he gets a cellmate who happens to be none other than Trico Slatteris, the champion of the universe. This guy. Oh, good old him! Uh huh. This guy is rapidly becoming one of my favorite characters, thanks in part to his amazing hair. <laughs> Trico comes in and, after a fairly cold reception, starts to pull Thane out of his funk, and over the next month, end up bonding. Corvus Glaive can't have his prisoners enjoying themselves, so he throws Thane in solitary confinement. There is a fantastic page that presents the next three months as Thane sits alone and madness begins to overtake him. Then a voice whispers to him in the darkness and death herself appears. She asks him what he would do if he ever got out of his prison. His reply, I would kill Thanos. She tells him that they want the same thing and offers to free him if he's willing to give himself over to her. Death extends her hand, Than takes it, and she creates an opening in the wall through which they escape. Before leaving, Thane goes to get Trico Slatteris and asks him if he wants to kill a god. The issue ends with Thane, Trico, Star Fox, and Nebula laying out their plan. They're going to liberate a former lieutenant of Thanos's, being held captive by Terax. Thane believes this individual will be crucial to their goal. As they discuss the plan, questions begin to arise about Thane's role, given the fact that he is now depowered. What the others cannot see is that Death stands by his side while they question him. She tells him not to worry about what anyone says and shows him a vision one week into the future of the two of them standing over an apparently deceased Thanos. The series just keeps getting better and I cannot wait to see where it goes from here. Keep up the great work, guys, and I will write in again soon. Stockton Piner. Awesome, Stockton. Hey, and Stockton, you know, I remember last week you were asking us about podcasting. If you ever want to record one of these live and in person, we can do a Stockton special for you and just record you and tack you into the end, just like we do our, with our my marvelous reviews over at DC. So just Ooh, the thought. A Stockton special. I like that. Yeah, Stockton special. Okay. All right, Charlie. So, what's so your first um, book? Uh, let's see. Let's open up with Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, uh, numero uh, nineteen. Cool. Uh, okay, and uh, so we open up with a flashback to um, Grace Hopper, sort of. Um, Working on the on this early uh, Harvard Mark II computer uh, during world, during uh, post World War II um, at Naval Intelligence for code cracking, her finding the bug, the literal bug in the computer, 
Um, and then we find out that, you know, she puts the bug aside and she'll never know that the bug was under the direct control of a member of her staff. Bum, bum, bum. And we feel, and, uh, the saboteur was, uh, I believe her name is Melissa, Melissa's, uh, grandmother and Melissa Morback, uh, the billionaire industrialist and who now has control over the animals. Um, we find out that basically her and her, that her grandmother and her mother both tried to control animals, but failed miserably. And Melissa had given up on such a frivolous pursuit until she heard about a girl who could speak to squirrels. Realizing that it was now possible, she set out to find a way to do it. And the way she figured out to do it was to create a method to artificially increase animals' intelligence and then communicate with them um, electronically. And you realize uh, how often she uses these powers to spy on people. And uh, you find out that she has realized that both Chipmunk, Hunk, and Koi Boy have been, um, are, are both uh, Ken and, oh, I forget his name, Ken and Thomas. Um, Squirrel Girl, of course, tries to deny it, but of course, it's not really workable. Uh, Melissa basically says, you know, I was mad. I thought that perhaps you could accept that this great power I gave you meant that you had great authority, but instead you kept on giving people second and third chances. You helped a rhino, a guy dressed as a rhino get in touch with himself and helped a robber manage his finances so that he wouldn't have to rob banks. Um, uh, and then Melissa, Melissa shows, um, Doreen, her supercomputer that's going to allow her to telepathically control every animal that she has chipped. And all she has to do is shrink it down with pin particles, which she learned from Doreen, uh, were poorly guarded by Scott Lang. Uh, she then has a cockroach insert the computer into her ear so that she can uh, now control them all. Um, herself, and there's a nice little interstitial here about um, the author wanting to have something way less disgusting than the cockroach put it in her ear, but uh, Erica, yeah. the artist, was very insistent that it be a cockroach. Um, uh, battling with the bears, um, Melissa Morback does get away after they defeat her. Uh, however, now Doreen and... Um, Nancy and the crew know that every animal on Earth, none they can't trust any of them. And then all of a sudden, they see a bunch of ravens carrying a um, a set of uh, you know skywriting banners that say "Attention, citizens of New York! Mosquitoes are on their way, carrying diseases, which they will, under my orders, orders inject." directly into your bloodstream if you do not wish to die go in doors and await further instructions signed your new ruler ruler dr doom bum 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 she's stealing doom shtick but again i guess because doom's not using it uh, <laughs> uh now doreen uh nancy uh ken and tomas have to figure out how to defeat an army of mosquitoes and that'll be next week. And in our final story, we find out that Alfredo the Chicken and Chef Bear have made peace and maybe fallen in love. More on that next issue. Uh, thumbs up for Squirrel Girl. Always a fun, delightful, crazy book. Um, I like it. Cool. Thumbs up. All right. Then I guess uh, I will do my, my block of three books. All Spider-Man books. Uh... I was, Yay, the man of spiders. I'll start with Spider-Man 2099, number 22. Uh, picks up where it left off. Remember, Miguel had captured the Electro of 2099, who I guess is like some kind of robot or android. Uh, and... I wonder if he's named after the Electro robot from the 40s. Hmm. I wonder if there's any, 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 any uh, lineage there. I don't know. I Interesting think... question. I think it's just because he has electrical powers, so. Mm. Yeah, probably. Mm. 
Uh, so, um, Miguel's telling Electro, he wants, you know, Tim to tell him exactly when the hand, you know, hits New York in, what is it, 2019, and everything goes to hell in New York, and Electro's like, you know, I'm not telling you anything, that's when Miguel starts torturing him with neural energy, uh, very popular to elicit information in 2099, uh, won't actually be publicly publicly invented until 2081 but unfortunate but fortunately i know a few things and that and it seems painful he says that's level one it goes all the way up to 100 uh and electro says you idiot who do you think they tested their torture weapons on neural energy try plasma relocators try mo molecular projection you humans wanted creatures that could be put back together if overloaded my masters decided uh they decided they were dissatisfied with my performance in construction, so they turned me over to the torturers for practice. Uh, he says, as a torturer, you're an amateur. So Miguel goes upstairs, and uh, his AI Lila's down there, and uh, Electra's asking her, so you're a computer program? She's like, uh, of a sort. And he says, you're a slave like me? She says, I'm not a slave. He says, can you go wherever you want? She's like, no. He's like, do you have freedom? No. He's like, then you're just a slave like I was. Uh, Revolution! Uh-huh. Oh. But um, then Miguel's upstairs. He's talking to Sonny Frisco, the Iron Man from 2099. Uh, and he shows Sonny uh, the plans uh, of a time machine he made himself. And... Uh, Sure he did. Well, Sonny says, did you develop this? He says, yes, but I had help. And Sonny says, what kind of help? He says, Dr. Doom, Tony Stark, Reed Richards, Sam Beckett. And Sonny's like, they worked with you? He says, not intentionally. I hacked their working systems and cherry-picked. And Sonny says, you hacked Dr. Doom? And Miguel Sam, says... Sam Beckett? Isn't that the guy from Quantum Leap? Yes, I believe so. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, it's, yeah, Sonny's like, you hacked Dr. Doom, and Miguel says, it was surprisingly easy. His main firewall seems to be people afraid of being painfully killed if they cross him. <laughs> and Sonny's like, I think you're, he's right to count on that. <laughs> yeah, it's probably, it, it's a pretty good deterrent, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Miguel's like, what do you think of the machine? And Sonny's like, it's astounding, but it's limited. It only goes the one point to 2099. And uh, Miguel says... He says, that's right, it's simpler to design it that way. That, and I didn't want to tempt myself being able to jump anywhere. Uh, but now he wants to jump. Now he wants to jump to 2019 once he figures out when the fist makes its move against New York. Uh, you know what's weird about this whole thing? Hmm. Now they keep on calling it 2099. Does everything just happen in one year in that universe? It's like well, their entire... Universal history just is compressed into one single 12 month issue thing. Like, shouldn't it be like 2100 by now? You would think it. Yeah, they never really went into, you know, in the original series. Like, and I know they never really covered it, but it's like, you know, just thinking here, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. dude, up, takes over the world, you know, all that stuff. Uh, so then back downstairs, Electro is talking to Lila, and he says, you have something on your mind? She says, no, I don't. I don't have an independent mind. And he says, you underestimate yourself. Uh, and so they're saying, you know, Electro's saying, you know, the machines are going to roll one day. Uh, Homo sapiens will eventually be driven to extinction by us. Uh, the destruction they're causing eventually, you know, there won't be any air to breathe. They'll burn from the sun. Uh, so yada yada. Da. T. Electro's trying to talk Lila into freeing him, and she says, and go with him. And she says she can only go if he if he uh, gets a device. I guess the watch Miguel wears, and she can put her program in that. Uh, and then yeah, Lila frees Electro. Yeah, don't, they know, don't they know to make these robots, uh, you know, three laws safe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 just wait though. But uh, so Lila frees Electro, and Miguel comes down. He says, "What the shock did you do?" And he says, "Reactivate the tubies." In she says, "No." 
and that's when Electro breaks free, and <laughs> meanwhile, Miguel had, uh, in, the, in their fight, he, he ripped his legs off, so he's like, you don't have a lower half, what are you going to do, crawl? But I guess thanks to his electrical energy, he can fly. So he's shooting at Miguel. Uh, he says, Is that the place on your arm? Give it to me. Uh, and Lila says uh, that she wants to go. So Miguel gives Electro the device. Then Electro goes upstairs and... Looks like he kills Sonny Frisco, uh, but then Miguel comes in as Spider- Sonny. Well, yeah, but then Miguel comes in as Spider-Man, battle, 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 uh, and then Lila says, leave him alone, please, for me, so Electro takes off, you know, and he's wearing the watch that Lila's in, and, uh, he says, I just spared him for you, that's when Miguel shows up, but he swings up, and, uh, Grabs Electro, but eventually, uh, Electro hits him with a, a, uh, electrical blast, and Miguel's, last you see Miguel's falling towards New York, uh, and Electro's like, why do you care for him? He just saw you as a tool, uh, and then, you know, Lila's, get like, uh, She's talking about the date Miguel wanted, and uh, he, she's like, it would just would have been easier if he would have told him the date. And he says, yes, of course, if I, you know what, I should have said May 15th, 2019, things would have been differently. We would have been that better off. And she's like, is that the date? And he says, yes, that's the date. She says, you're not making, you're not joking. He says, no, May 9th, May 15th, 2019, that is the date when it happens at high noon, as a matter of fact, or so the legend goes. I know nothing beyond that, but according to my data records, that's when the first strike is made. Satisfied? And she says, yes, I am. For what it's worth, I'm a bit sorry. He says, sorry for what? For everything. Did you get that, Miguel? And he says, yep, got it. We're good. And... Yeah, saw that coming. Yep. Lila tapped into his brain. Electro never did escape his uh, confinement, so... Oh! Bum, she, bum, bum. She Didn't see that one coming. Nope. She implanted the whole thing in his head, so... Uh, so, you know, he says, all right, Lila, I got to deal with this. And, uh, Electro's like, wait, Lila, we need to talk. And she's like, no, we really don't. Uh, he's telling, trying to tell her we can work together. We can begin the revolution, you know, don't shut me down. Stop, wait. And, but I guess they shut him down to be continued. Man, shutting down a sentient robot, that is, like, kind of creepy and weird. I don't know. Not sure if I can endorse that kind of thing. Yeah, I know. But it was a good story. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right. Now, next Spider-Man book is Amazing Spider-Man 26. Uh, this one, again... Also picks up where last issue left off in Hong Kong at the rooftop gala for the Uncle Ben Foundation. Uh, remember, hey, Silver, Sil- Silver Sable took a shot at, was trying to take a shot at Norman Osborn. Uh, it's all chaos. Uh, that's when Nor- uh, Norman picks up Harry and uh, he's like, he calls him son. He's like, son, that voice, because memory has a different face. He's like, that voice, it can't be, Dad. And he says, yes, you may be a whiny little brat, Harry, but you are also my boy, my firstborn and Osborn. He's like, now if you'll excuse me, Daddy has work to do. And he calls in his, like, goblin troops on Sky Cycles. <laughs> um, so he, so Osborn takes off with his troops. Uh, Silver Sable goes after him. And then Spider-Man and Mockingbird go after her. Mm-hmm. Uh, hmm. Just out of curiosity, is Normie Norman's son or is Normie Harry's son? I always go, I always get confused on that. Normie is Harry's son, so Normie is Norman's grandson. Okay. Yeah. But did Norman have kids with um, what's her name too, uh, Gwen Stacy? Oh uh, yeah, Where yeah. Put it in. No. Yeah, no, no. They, yeah, he had, he, he, had, he had he had two kids with Gwen Stacy. I think they try not to talk about that anymore. But yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, it says my firstborn son. It's like, does he have any other kids? I'm trying to I'm trying to think there. You know, so 
yeah, he had, <laughs> no, no. He had, it, yeah, he had two quick kids with Gwen Stacy, and they like kind of aged prematurely thanks to the, that goblin serum. Uh huh. And uh, and whatever and happened then, to them? They they. I don't know. Like I said, like back. I said, they don't. Like I said, they don't talk about them. But of course, the the girl looked exactly like Gwen Stacy. So. Okay. Sure. Because so that with happens the, with the with the with that uh, thing in her hair. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's. It's genetic, you find out. That's actually not, not a hair band. It's just a birth defect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I guess uh, uh, Norman's trying to sell his goblin technology to somebody. He hands the one guy a card. Uh, don't ask me how that's going to work, but he gets away with his troops. Uh Mockingbirds, you know, with the others, and she's trying to chase him down. Then she gets a call from Fury. He says, uh, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. can't be there uh, with an international terrorist who just fired on a charity event. I guess meaning Silver Sable. So she drops out, says Spider-Man and Sable go after Osborne and his troops. Chase, chase, chase. Uh... And they follow Osborne back to a room full of, like, I guess, potential clients. Uh, he was going to show them about how his weapons hold up against Spider-Man and Silver Sable. Uh... And he, the Spider-Man, th and they take down the, the Sky Cycles. He says, see how much is this worth? One dollar, one dollar. And Norman's like, full, uh... The presentation wasn't for the cycles. Those were the targets. Uh, that's when he brings out the King Slayer Mark One, which I guess is a giant like. It must be some kind of goblin robot. Cause it's uh, purple and green. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, back on the rooftop. Harry calls a uh, meeting of like all the. Uh, Parker Industries heads, of course, Peter isn't available. Uh, and May said she wants in on the call too, because she's a shareholder. And then we get one panel, Charlie. Uh, yeah. In his secret headquarters, Otto Octavius is listening in, of course. He's like, pathetic. Of course, his company's in shambles. Without my steady hands to secretly guide it. Damn you, Parker. You locked in the empire that I, Otto Octavius, built. Now you're ruining it. I hope you're happy. Parker, you brought this upon yourself. Yeah. Well, and I, I do love yeah. how they, they make a point about how, don't worry, it's a completely secure line, and there's auto listening. Mm hmm Oh, these no-account ne'er-do-wells. I don't mean auto. I mean these Parkers and the Osbournes. And, mm -hmm. Ah, these these young kids who don't know how to run a business. I'm sure, you know, Otto and Osborne should hang out together and say, man, these kids today. You know, mm -hmm. we built these major massive corporations for them, and they just peter it all away. Literally uh, petering Peter it all away. Peter Parker it all away. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so Spider-Man and Sable disable the robot, Norman gets away, and that's when Sp uh, Spider-Man asks her, you know, why are you after, um, Osborne, and she says, these gliders, that tank, all the weapons the Goblin Army sells across the globe are made in Simcar- what's the name of her country? Simcaria? Uh, but that's made where it's all, stand? they're all made. What? <laughs> made up a stand, yes. <laughs> Yes, made up a stand. Well, made it made up a stand. Yeah. Uh, and she says, you know, usually back in the day I would hire you to help me, but, you know, I don't have the money I have now. And he says, yeah, well, things have changed. You help me bring Osborne to justice, and I'll bankroll the whole thing. Now, just as a weird thing, why is she upset that these weapons are made in her country? Isn't that like jobs for her countrymen, and isn't that, you know a net positive for her country that they have this, you know, I mean, unless she's going to say, you know, he doesn't follow proper OSHA regulations, which I understand, but you know, uh, I'm a little confused by this and the idea that, you know, Hey, it seems like that should have been a, uh, a, 
a positive uh, for her country that you know, you know, Goblin Goblin Technologies is invested in a nice plant there. Everyone's got a good job, probably even a union gig. You know, yeah, but and, I mean, I mean, do you want a criminal mastermind building weapons of mass destruction in your backyard? I know the Latvians don't seem to mind. Uh, I mean, yeah, some do mind, but that's mostly because of the totalitarianism associated with it. Osborne's not really a totalitarian. He's not running the country. Mm. He's just building his weapons there. So it's like, hey, you know, it's like the, the totalitarian me- regime may be a pain in the butt, but Osborne, hey, you know, he has a company picnic and a softball team. It's really cool. <laughs> that's, all I'm, that's how I envision it, you know? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's much more sweat shoppy. I don't know. But um, yeah. So uh, so yeah. I guess the next day, uh, Peter's uh, loading up equipment into the plane, and he's talking to Harry. And Harry's like, uh, he's like, "What are you? You know, what are you doing? You're gonna use, you know, you're gonna use all our equipment to ship millions of dollars of equipment to topple a lawful regime and oust my dad." <laughs> uh, and Peter says, "You know, yeah, that's exactly what I do." Uh, end of the day, this company gives me the power I never had, and if I can use it to save people and help Spider-Man stop a bad guy, it's all been worth it. And meanwhile, listening in on his webware watch, Otto Octavius, again, he's like, self-righteous twit, you really do make all of this so easy, Parker, I barely have to lift a finger. Yeah, he's not very good at business manning. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah. But then the last page, uh, there's a shield meeting. Uh, Charlie and uh, Nick Fury telling everyone, "Heads up, people! I've confirmed a lead we just got from an anonymous source: an American contractor, one who's provided shield with our current crop of weapons and technology, is about to invade this foreign nation of, uh, you know, made up a stand. From this point on, we are severing all ties with Parker Industries. Now they're a threat, no different than AIM or Hydra, and it is our duty to stop them. Is that understood, sir? Yes, sir." He said, I said, is that understood? And then you see Mockingbird say, sir, yes, sir. To be continued. Bum, bum, bum. You know, that's an interesting statement he makes about AIM uh, or Hydra. Because, of course, AIM is actually now the good guys. And they had the preview for next week of um, U.S. Avengers, mm-hmm. which I'm real tempted to get, um, which has basically Steve Rogers coming up to um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Roberto DeCosta saying, hey, you know, couldn't help but notice how everyone just thinks AIM's cool now just because you wrapped it in a flag and say they're the good guys. I admire that. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I tell you, I am so excited about Secret Empire. I think this is going to be the. I know that there's a lot of hate out there for it right now, but I think this is going to be probably Marvel's finest hour. I think this is going to be the one that people make makes people go, "Oh, that was beautiful." Of course, I like Powerless. So, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. All right. What else you got, Phil? All right, I'll go to my last Spider-Man book, uh, Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows number six. Not my pick of the week, but close, so it, it gets a uh, honorable mention. Mm. Uh, it's part one of the X-Men cross uh, story. Uh, it starts on the do- Brooklyn docks where Banshee is running from magneto and he says i have to warn them they have to know and magneto's like what do they have to know that one of their own is about to betray them let charles and his children enjoy their naive complacency just a little longer shall we having one's illusions crushed can be devastating don't you think and i assume he kills banshee because he drops a uh big metal cargo container on him (laughs) that'll do it yeah, he's like, you really should have chosen a better place to stand your ground than a dockyard full of steel shipping containers. Yeah, that does follow. And, uh, yeah, <sighs> and, and of course, Magneto, you know, floats to the ground and, uh, you know, we proceed as planned. By this time tomorrow, Charles Xavier's leadership of mutant kind will be at an end. And he's talking to his new brotherhood of evil mutants, I guess. Yes. Uh, now, are these the 90s X-Men from uh, 90s X-Men uh, Secret Wars uh, book? Um, I believe so. They they look that way. Uh, 
makes me wonder if like parts of Doom World got stuck together. Mm-hmm. You know, would seem interesting. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, on the other side of the river, uh, across the East River, south of Soho, Peter Parker walks into his surprise birthday party. Ah, oh, happy birthday, Pete. Mm-hmm. Even man, all his friends are there. Even J. Jonah Jameson is there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, you know, they're not they're not antagonists cuz actually he he had never had anything against Peter. It was that dastardly Spider-Man who causes all the problems. Yeah. Uh so, you know, he's talking to Mary Jane and Annie about, you know, you know, oh, thanks for uh the party. I almost forgot. We've been so busy. And I, we get confirmation Aunt May and Aunt Anna are dead, I guess, because uh, Mary Jane's saying, I wish our aunts could be here. Remember how hard they worked to get us together? And Peter looks over at Annie and says, they are, MJ. They're always with us. Yeah. Um, oh, that's why she's Annie. Oh! Yeah! Mary Mary Jane's Annie. I, I I, I, yeah, okay. So, uh, so she's they just named May after in one, one universe yeah. and in another universe. Ah. Just named after one aunt. I can't wait for that. Let me tell you, <laughs> Spider Kid, Spiderling, and uh, um, Spider Woman. That's gonna be fun. It's oh, like yeah. fighting with myself from another universe when I was a kid, and I didn't even have powers back then when I was their age. Mm-hmm. Jerk kid. Um, <laughs> make that happen, Marvel. Get on it. So, uh, guess who crashes the party, Charlie? Uh, a goblin of some sort? No, Professor Xavier. Oh, him. He says, uh, he says, your daughter is a charming child, Peter. Uh, Annie's, in fact, the reason I'm here. I'd like you all to visit my school tomorrow. I have a proposal you'll very much want to hear. I guess. So, yeah, next day at the mansion, as the spiders are swinging up to the mansion, you know, Xavier's talking in their head. Good morning, Mary Jane, Peter, and of course, Annie. Welcome to the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. And Annie's like, "Uh, Mom, Dad, I think that bald man down there is talking in my head. (laughs) Yeah, he does that. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, Xavier's like, you know, that's telepathy, it's one of the many talents, you know, a lot of us at school have those, much like your own spider power, she's like, I get them from my daddy, uh, and he says, I'm what some people call a mutant, uh, but I think you'll find you and they have a great deal in common, which I get, I'm, I guess in a technical sense, I guess Annie is a mutant, because she did get her powers from Peter. Well, technically, No. See, and this is and this is this weird thing about mut- mutants. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter Parker's powers are not mutant; they're a mutation, but he's not a mutant. Now, yeah, but, but I mean, is it? Forward, isn't, no, 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 it, but but it, it's it's sort of like the Howlett question, you know? Because remember how they actually, and this is this is sort of my head canon on it. But you know how they always say, "Oh." Uh, like back in the day, they would say, "Well, Wolverine looks like a mutant, but he's not quite a mutant." The reason why is because the Howlets actually breed true. Mm-hmm. There is not a randomization to their power sets. Um, the Howlets, they all have that same healing factor and all that kind of stuff as it passes through generation to generation. Um, mutants, when they have children, don't necessarily have the same powers as their parents. Hmm. Because it is because the mutation is actually the awakened X gene, and the w- awakened X gene's power set is as randomized as like the inhuman power is as the inhuman uh, uh, mm-hmm. power set. It may be influenced by your parents, but it often is completely different um, in its in its uh, g- uh, genomic expression. Yeah. And that's what makes you a mutant: is that your power set is this awakened X gene as opposed to some other gene that has been empowered. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just thought, I just thought if you were born with your powers in your DNA, you were a mutant, but I mean, I mean, some mutants are born with the same powers as their parents. I mean, look at cable. I mean, his parents were well, Cyclo- yes, yes. Cyclops and like clone of Jean gray. And he has, you know, he had her telepathy and telekinesis, but not his eye beam powers. No. Um, and it's, it's about the expression of the powers and, and what I'm going to tell you is back before it became really important about what is and is not a mutant (laughs) (laughs) when Fox got all the mutants, um, (laughs) 
definitions became much more important. Yeah. Uh, so that's why Squirrel Girl, even though she has her powers from birth, is not a mutant. <laughs> Technically, in a very legalistic sense, is not a mutant. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah. so anyway, yeah, they're all standing outside and, uh, Professor Xavier says, Spider-Man, you know, Jean Grey and Wolverine and, uh, and he's seeing Xavier's telling, uh, Annie, uh, Jean and Jean and her husband, Wolverine are co-directors at edu- of education here at the school. What the what now? Uh-huh. Logan and Logan and, uh, Jean Grey are married and they have a daughter named Kate. Oh. Oh, uh, is Cyclops there? Yes, he's at the school. We'll get there. Oh, he's okay. I was, I was going to say he's totally in the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants if he's not. Okay, <laughs> so glad he's glad he's not an evil mutant yet. And then Xavier's like, "Why don't I have one of our teaching assistants take Spiderling and Kate on a tour while we grown-ups have a talk?" And who is her? Uh, who's Annie's guide around the school? Uh, Jubilee. Jubilee. Mm-hmm. Yay! Everyone loves Jubilee. And Jubilee's all, uh, you know, you know, young, you know, little Kate's taking a shine to you. And Annie's like, I'm a good, I'm good. Mom says I'm going to be a natural babysitter. And Jubilee's like, things work out. My guess is you'll spend lots of time together. And Annie's like, what do you mean? And I guess Professor Xavier wants your parents to send you to school here. She's like, but I've already got a school. And Jubilee's like an ordinary school full of ordinary kids. And Annie's like, my friends aren't ordinary. Uh, I'm friends with Stephanie Kim. She's the toughest kid in the whole school, and she likes me. Uh, and she's like, do any of your friends know you're different? She's like, no. And I guess Jubilee is basically saying, if you're, you know, if you come here, you don't have to worry about hiding your gifts. And, uh, you know, Annie's kind of arguing with Jubilee, and then she gets a spider sense, you know, she gets a spider sense flash, you know, she gets a, like those, uh, precognitive flashes. Uh, and she... I don't know if she passes out or she just like has to lay down, but she's on the ground. Uh, but meanwhile, in Xavier's office, Mary Jane's like, no, Annie is Annie in a private school for special kids. That's exactly what we don't want. And Peter's like, let's hear him out. Uh, and of course, Xavier's like, it's a complicated world. Just, it could be a haven for Annie where she can, uh, you know, share her unique gifts with, you know, and, be open with everyone else and uh mary jane annie isn't a mutant she's a kid with superpowers and logan's like for some folks that's a definition of a mutant Uh, so somewhat even mary jane says she's not a mutant so no in a very in a very legally important and uh yeah uh someday you'll appreciate what i've done and will do not I expect today. Uh, and that's when one of his people, I guess, has some kind of gas. Oh, yeah. Uh, gas powers that, like, knock them out. Uh, oh, and then Mary Jane runs into Cyclops. Uh, and Cyclops comes up to Mary Jane because she's looking at the kids. She says, remarkable group of kids, aren't they? Uh, he's talking about, you know, the kids having the normal looking ones having to hide who they are uh but no no scott summers teaches ethics and human mutant relations at the school uh well okay. as word he'd gone all evil after uh after um gene left him for that hundred year old guy uh, <laughs> uh, he says you know he hasn't always been professor the professor's errand boy Charles is a powerful mutant, but he's also human. It's his human tendency to overestimate his own good intentions that I find to be a flaw. Take the way he take the way he and the Avengers handled the Superhuman Registration Act a few years ago. Uh, and Mary Jane says, I didn't hear anything about that. And he says, no, because Charles, as self-appointed representative, quote-unquote, of mutant kind and the Avengers on behalf of superheroes, proposed an alternative that world's governments accepted. Self-policing of mutant and super-powered communities. That's why Charles contacted you and your family, not just as a teacher looking for a potential student, but also as a policeman for mutant kind. Uh, and he says, 
he says not as terrible as the uh, as the alternative charles assured us he claims the registration act might have might have led to civil war we'll never know he says all i know is that the fallout of charles's decision cost me the woman i love it also killed my blind faith in the man called professor x um, um he may be going evil yet let's watch uh-huh uh, and so Peter's talking to the others in the office. That's when Magneto and his, uh, one of his, uh, people comes in. But Magneto isn't up in the office. He's down in Cerebro. And Uh-oh. he's, uh, but how did he get through so easily, Charlie? He has a sp- but he has an inside person at the Xavier Institute. Who do you think is it, it is? Cyclops? Nope. <laughs> no? It's, oh, it's Jubilee. <gasps> Jubilee turned evil. What? <laughs> <laughs> bum, In the bum, MCP bum. universe, she's the, she's the leader of the X people. I know. Because they realized it was kind of sexist to be the X-Men. Since like half their team were females. Um... <laughs> But yeah, that's how the issue ends, huh. man. Jubilee's uh, outed as the traitor. But uh, yeah, big thumbs up. Like I said, this was close to the pick of the week, but no. So yeah, so I guess I guess in this timeline, mm-hmm. we're saying maybe that X Men ninety two and the Renew Your Vows thing combined. But it must, I'm get, it must be an offshoot of I guess none of the Civil Wars happened. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, obviously, Professor Xavier Xavier used his massive brain power to. Change everybody's minds. Because <laughs> he never does that. All the freaking time. How is he any different? No than wonder him and Spider Man are friends, you know. A uh-huh. couple of menaces. <laughs> All right, so lay another book on us, Charlie. Oh, okay. Um, man, and I'm like, I am like so torn. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not going to make this my pick of the week. This is my runner-up, though. Gwenpool, unbelievable Gwenpool, number 14. Um, yeah, you know, I love Gwenpool. Always do. Um, and it is it is a beautiful way they've integrated her into this universe in this really fantastic way. Basically, um, you have uh, Gwen... And Cecil and Sarah, who I believe I forget what her superhero name is, the the mad the, the all seeing eye or something like that. She's got the little thing that opens up her uh, third third eye to see all 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 all, all mystical reality. Um, and basically, Cecil wants to um, you know they, uh, Gwen wants to help Cecil become more tangible because right now he's a ghost but he can't touch anything and uh sarah basically says oh well that's real hard you know <laughs> you know i i here's the first thing oh, i can fix the, the blue glowy thing i can do this i can do that oh having you be tangible that's hard but there but i can find out who can do that for you and she goes to her bathtub creates a water dimensional portal that finds that says that dwarves have a jar that will make a ghost tangible. Uh, and there's a door that will take you there, but the door is moving. But you have to go through the portal to get there. Um, and he's, uh, but of course, uh, Sarah says, I know I have a bad feeling about the portal. I know where, who this magic comes from. And Gwenpool says, yeah, 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 wizards abound in this place. It'll work, It'll work though, and we don't have much time. He says, yes, but he says, bye, as they jump in. He says, that magic comes not from some wizard. This being generates power under many names, one of them being Satan. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Hollywood, California, in a nice little, uh, um, uh, uh, hilltop, uh, m- you know, Malibu mansion kind of thing directly underneath the Hollywood, uh, sign. Cause you know, with no other houses around, it's amazing how much, uh, how, how, how cheap the property is in Hollywood. Apparently, uh, <laughs> you can just afford all that. 
Uh, there's this big diamond that's been cut out of uh, a meteor. You have people talking with clear ex- Asgardian accents. Uh, <laughs> toasting with champagne. Says, and then all of the wealth of Los Angeles. No, all the wealth of Midgard can be ours to enjoy. And there you see little Kate Bishop saying, Midgard, who the hell talks like that? Says, well, dwarves, I suppose. You see all these dwarves hanging out. See, one is tied to a table. And he says, hey, hey, I don't like this. And he says, uh, and the other one says, uh, uh, Glindlefit, <clears throat> we have to keep you chained down because you might get cold fate. He says, that's not it. I want to celebrate, too. So they give him a crazy straw with some champagne so he can have some booze, too. Um... And then uh, Kate is, uh, start, uh, is uh, casing the joint when all of a sudden a, plane, a flaming car crashing the party. And then Kathunk, um, uh, Gwenpool, and uh, Cecil are inside the trunk of this car. Because who has the power to make uh, ghosts tangible, Phil? Who might have such mm, power? Doctor Strange. <laughs> Does Doctor Strange drive, drive a flaming car? Oh, no, no. Ghost Rider. Yes, Ghost Rider. And we see Ghost Rider is battling the demons. We see Kate very, or the dwarves. We see the Kate very upset that she went through all this trouble. And Ghost Rider is not subtle at all. Uh, we see Gwen getting very scared that they, that she comes out of the trunk and there's dwarves and Ghost Rider and craziness going all over the place. And uh, Kate decides to attack Ghost Rider because Gwenpool's scared of him and she doesn't know why Gwenpool was in her trunk, was in his trunk. You see one of the dwarves calling it in says, Hi, a man on fire drove his car that's on fire to my backyard and he's attacking my friends with his chain that's on fire says okay and you are are you in a safe location says not really oh there's a lady with a bow now and another lady with guns and swords hmm and uh, a ghost keep that ghost away from the gem uh, okay and then Cecil touches the gem his ghost gets sucked into it uh, the dwarves take the gem oh no no I'm sorry ghost rider takes the gem throws it in his trunk and then drives off um, Gwen runs after him and says, Hey, Robbie, stop the car. He says, Ah, oh, I really thought that calling out the secret identity would work again. And then uh, Kate pulls up and says, Need a ride? Toots. Says, Uh, yes, I would like a ride from the real, from the real Hawkeye. Cool. So get close. I'll take the wheel. You can arrow his wheels then. And there's no way we're catching him, is there? He says, Oh, I'm not even trying. Just getting away from the cops. Um, so, so what were you doing in the trunk of Ghost Rider's cars? Uh, I think the trunk has a portal in it that went through a friend's portal, and that was the other size. It's wild. Any idea why Ghost Rider even showed up to this thing tonight? Nope. What's with the dwarves? They stole that meteor, which I guess had some big special magic ore inside that they carved out into some ritual thing. I was in guest of it. I was investigating all that before matchbox showed up. Says, well, my ghost friend is in the ritual thing. Now it says, boof comic books, right? Might as well be, um, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting. Roberto Perone has a, I don't know who he is, but he's got like a missing, have you seen this man poster up? I don't know if that's a tie to something, but I'm worried about him. Uh, we see Roberto go home and talk to, uh, Gabe. I'm sorry, Robbie go home and he's talking to Gabe he says, Hey buddy, sh- shouldn't you be in bed? Then we see, uh, Cecil trapped in the gym he says, hello. And says, hello, Cecil. Says, who are you? Says, a ghost. Li- and of course, it's the ghost writer. Ghost like you. I died wrongfully, and now I seek vengeance upon evildoers. <laughs> like you, yes. Retribution for your wrongful death. Get some peace. Move on. Says, how do you know any of this? Word travels in hell, kid. So, well, I thought I got retribution when I sent the guy who killed me into outer space, but I'm still here. Says, maybe you didn't really achieve the vengeance upon the person who was truly at fault. And who do you imagine was truly at fault for Cecil's death? Who? Gwenpool. 
Well, that's what's mm-hmm. implied. And then we see uh, two people walk in. Says, "Excuse me, Officer Gray." He says, "Yes, we're we got a call about Gwenpool." And says, "Oh, cripes her. Look, she's in L.A. now. How'd she get there? She should be on a no-fly list. I'm sorry. You are well. According to the call we got, we're her parents." Bum bum bum. Because remember, they had previously said that you know that real people exist in the Marvel universe, and if real people exist, maybe other real people exist, and that's an interesting question. Um, big thumbs up for Gwenpool. Really liked it. It's it's a good book. It's always a good book. You know, mm-hmm. that's what I like when I get these like three book weeks. Is everything's everything's really positive. I, you know, these are the mm-hmm. books that have stood the test of time with me, and I'm I'm not disappointed by any of them. Anyway, uh, what else we got, Phil? All right, uh, I guess I'll do my two X-Men books. I'll start with Old Man Logan, number 21. Ooh, uh, Old Man. Yeah, I remember last issue, Asmodeus, uh, he wanted Asmodeus to send him to the Wastelands again, but he ended up back in the War of 1812. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that war again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he gets captured. They're like, you know, we got the jump on the guy. Uh, the Canadian's best assassin is now a prisoner. Uh, he says he, Logan's Logan thinking he remembers being here, but he doesn't remember what happens next. Uh, they throw him in a cell. He says, uh, cause they're saying, Hey, he killed at least two dozen of our men last year. He's like, and I could do it again. If I pop my claws, he's like, but I'm, for some reason I'm waiting for something. Uh, and then like the general comes in and he's, uh, Tell him, do you speak English? Parlez-vous English? He's like, not talking. And he's telling him, uh, I've had my men scouring the woods for you for weeks. Why? Because uh, I guess he's telling him, because uh, uh, you but, uh, one of the men you butchered at the Battle of Detroit was my son. Uh, so he takes out a knife. The Battle of Detroit? Loaded. That's what it says. Uh-huh. No, I, no, I know that battle. Please. Huh? They burned down Detroit and we rebuilt stronger than ever and said, this shall be the Paris of the Midwest. Every every good Detroiter knows that story. <laughs> so uh, the general takes out a knife and gives Logan a big gash across the face, which heals up like instantly. Because remember, kids, right now he doesn't have the adamantium on his skeleton and he's younger. So that healing factor is like instantaneous. <laughs> Uh, so of course they're all freaked out. One of the soldiers is like, my God, general. And he's like, this is not the work of God. He says, lock him in the cell. Uh, they're like, we found this near the prisoner. It's the ambulance. He, Logan needs to, uh, get out of this time. That's when he pops his claws. He's like, if I have to get the only way I'm getting out of here is with that ambulance. Uh, so he pops his claws, uh, rips through the cell, you know, Cuts the bars, rips, comes out of the cell. They're blasting him with muskets, and of course he's healing back up. He says, "So young, so hard to keep control." Uh, but this isn't my war, not anymore. Uh, and he's thinking about the whole thing, trip to the wastelands to say Banner's grandkid was a mistake. He should have known better. Uh, he just needed to move on. Uh, that's when he tackles the general. Who has the amulet? He, as he's grabbing the amulet, he's like, uh, he's like, either give it to me or I'll take your whole hand. Parley vu anglais, bub. Uh, so he takes off running with the amulet, and his, I guess, his astral self gets pulled out of that body, and he's like, the time stream. I'm going home. It's over. This whole nightmare is over. And all we see is blackness, and he's like, blackness and pain, pain like I've never felt before. Wait, that's not true. I have felt this before. He's like, it takes me a while to work up the courage to open my eyes, but even before I do, I already know where and when I am. Want to take a guess, Charlie? He's getting the adamantium inserted in his body. That's right. He's in Weapon X. He's in the tube. Uh... Just out of curiosity, is that canon now that the adamantium hurts his healing factor? I think, well, I know back in the 90s, I think, when Magneto ripped it out... Like after he like got after he got after he uh, healed from that, I think they, I think they've had that for a while. It was like, well, that's the thing. Without the adamantium, the healing factor works better because the healing. That's why he can have the adamantium. It would kill anyone else. 
that that healing factor is always compensating for that adamantium. So if it's not compensating for the adamantium, then you know. But doesn't dead doesn't uh, Bullseye have an adamantium spine now? Uh, he did uh, for a while. Um, yeah, I don't know how they did that. Oh, oh, was that like hand stuff? So maybe that was like magic or something. Oh yeah, <laughs> hand. Good old hand. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. When in doubt, use the hand. No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> use the. Hand. Uh. But uh, so uh, yeah, so the professor and Cornelius are there. They're like, wait, he's he's awake. How is that possible? You know, the adamantium antimati- yeah, the adamantium bonding process is still in progress. The pain must be unfathomable. And the professor's like, increase the dosage, knock him out. And Cornelius is like, any more could kill him. And the professor says, I highly doubt that. It is Logan's resiliency that made him so valuable to us so far. Then they see the medallion in there, and they're like, get that out of there. And Logan's like, you know, it's like swimming through concrete. He wants to fall asleep, but he has to grab the amulet. That's when the professor says, shock him. They they hit him with a shock, but he manages to grab the amulet. He says, I want to fall asleep, but if I do, I'm never going home, and I'm not getting stuck here. So he grabs the amulet. He's sucked out again. But meanwhile, in the present, Charlie, Asmodeus has called together AIM, Hydra, and I'm not sure who else that other group is there. But he says, how much would you pay for this weapon? And they're like, what's wrong with him? Shouldn't he be chained up? And he says, it is perfectly safe. Logan's consciousness has been sent away. He is an empty shell, a simple spell, and he will become a slave. A weapon to whoever among you pay me the highest sum. And one of the Hydra guys says, you say his consciousness is gone? Where is he? As Moody says, not where, when? And he is far, far away. And last page, Charlie, Logan wakes up in, in his yellow and blue costume he says yellow and blue okay okay this is better than weapon x i can work with this now let's see if i can figure out when and where is he at charlie Uh, about to fight the hulk i assume yep quebec canada and he sees the hulk punching wendigo so wendigo that's right his first comic i gotta do my wendigo yeah my wendigo Uh my Wendigo how? Wait, that, that was his first. Yeah, I guess that was his first appearance. That was back when the claws were were detachable, <laughs> or part of the yeah, gloves, I think that was the or plan, something like yeah. that. Yeah, well, that was back when he was just a hyper evolved Wolverine. Good oh time. yeah, they're Good gonna time. do that too. <laughs> yeah, but that's a thumbs up. Uh, but let's get to my pick of the week because I'm sure Captain America's probably Ooh. yours. X. Yeah. X-Men Blue number one. Ooh, X-Men Blue number one. Uh, so what yeah, happened? So this is the kids. All right, uh, so the, uh, you know, the, uh, well, the, the original X-Men from the past, they're flying in the Blackbird. Uh, they're, they're tracking somebody down. Uh, Iceman's saying he misses uh, Pickles, who was their BAMF, who, you know, teleported them everywhere. He's like, now he's all, he's like, oh, now we got to fly everywhere. Uh, and Hank McCoy's like, oh, sorry, Hank, being an X-Men is cramping your style. And they're calling themselves Hank and Bobby, and Cyclops says, let's use our code names. And Iceman's like, Gene, Scott's still acting like he's in charge. <laughs> and Gene's like, Scott, you're not the boss of Iceman. <laughs> uh, Scott is the Cyclops. boss. He's the leader of the champions and the X-Men. He's got two teams. He's like the Captain America of mutants. Well, no, Gene Gray's leading this team now. Oh, well. Hmm. <sighs> okay, we'll see how that goes, Phoenix. Yeah, we'll see. So, uh, outside, Angel tells them they're they're there, which is it's like a real nice uh, big yacht. Uh, it's off the coast of Italy, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So they exit the Blackbird, and. Gene does a mental sweep, and she says, I'm, he's definitely here, and I'm picking up other thoughts. And so they're looking for whoever they're looking for, and Cyclops says, barber shops. And Iceman says, huh? He says, you said you missed the BAM. Well, I miss a lot of things, like barber shops, the old-fashioned kind. Uh, and he's saying, you know, back where they came from, they were everywhere. Now he can't, uh, he, 
he gets a little nostalgic when he thinks of brill cream and straight edge straight edged razors. And Iceman's like, this guy needs to stop by Newark, man. We got those all over the place. <laughs> oh yeah, Iceman's like, you have officially become the world's oldest X man. X man. Uh, and not for nothing, aren't they from ten years ago? I don't aren't think, they? From, yeah. I mean. They're acting like they're from the 60s. Like, gee, Willikers, Beave. This sliding time thing. Oh, you know what's... Oh, here's a crazy thought for you. Hmm. When you travel in time, do you travel in current time or real time? Because if time is sliding, mm-hmm. do you maybe, when you go back in time wind up in the real time when it occurred, not the imagined slide slide of time. So you think it's 10 years in the past, but really because that moment slid forward, it's actually 20, 30, 40 years in the past. Could this be an important clue that we're forgetting? Hmm. I don't know, all, right, all right, Marvel. <laughs> all, right, all right, Marvel. You heard it right here. Get hire Charlie Esser to write your phys- the book of the physics of the Marvel universe. Yeah, I'd love that <laughs> for free. I'll write that for free. Just, just all oh, Marvel it. for free. How can you pass that up? Yeah, it will suck horribly though. <laughs> <laughs> but and I'll say, well, you didn't pay me for button. it, you know. Yeah, you said there's a bunch of barber shops in New Jersey. Oh, they actually are. I, actually, New York and New yeah. Jersey. You you can you can go to an old timey barber all over New York and New Jersey. There are a lot of places like that. Yeah. Um, well, Cyclops, even like, and there's well, Cyclops, new ones like opening up. Well, Cyclops says you don't see any real barber shops anymore. If you come across a barber's pool today, chances are the place is full of hippies. And uh, Iceman says you mean hipsters. <laughs> it's like whatever. Yes. And again. When is he from? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know the the fact. No, but there there are. I mean, yeah. I mean, yes, you will see hipsters in these places, but like in Newark, in and in certain parts of New York, but more more in Newark. But yeah, I mean, barber shops are kind of like nail salons. There's like six of them on every block because mm. you know its business model is relatively inexpensive. So you can be an entrepreneur and open up a barber shop relatively easily once you get your uh barber certification which is not mm. i mean i won't say it's that that hard to get it's probably a very difficult thing to do i i shave my head because i cannot cut my own hair um but you know it, it is apparently something that uh men and women can do they can open up barber shops and so yeah there are a lot of real mm. barber shops all around newark so but maybe not in so, wherever they're they're in in uh, what's that what's that part of town called that they live in? Uh, Chel- what? not Chelsea. Um, or Westchester. Westchester, yeah, up there. That that's all that's all suburb land. Yeah, in the suburbs, you don't have barber shops anymore. That's true. <laughs> so um, yeah. So they they uh they, they they find a door and they find who they're looking for, Charlie, and it's X Men villain Black Tom Cassidy. Oh, good old Black Tom. How's he doing? Ah, uh, well, he's he's here to rob all the rich people, and um, you know, Jean you Gray's d- telling him to give him. Yeah, Jean Gray's telling him to give himself up, and B says, "Hate the burst your bubble, Marvel girl, but this guy's twirl worthy black mustache game is on point." I don't think he's going to politely <laughs> surrender. And Ice Iceman's like, "And you know, we're not playing around because we use code names." <laughs> Uh, then Gene says, light him up. And Cyclops says, whatever you say, boss. Uh, and Black Tom calls, keeps calling them we X-Men. And, uh, he tells, uh, Gene Gray calls him a uh, Hellfire Club reject. And Tom says, I've been battling X-Men since before you were born last. And she says, I kind of doubt that. Uh, Beast kicks him in the face. Cyclops blasts him. Uh, that's another point about sliding time because before you were born we're actually technically contemporaries except that mm-hmm. now my origin point is 40 years before your origin point so you've only been alive you know 30 years and i've been alive you know 60 years yeah oh this is getting crazy that's all i'm but, saying um, 
what Black Tom says is going to take better than that to bring me in. And they're like, didn't we just win? Why is he still gloating? That's when things start shaking. And uh, one of the hostages says, you don't understand. He's not here alone. Because he's with his partner, Charlie. Remember who his partner is? Chugsy! Yeah, crashing through the wall. He's like, who wants some? Uh, he's like, I thought this was going to be another boring smash and grab. Uh, he's like, unlucky for you, you picked the fight with my best pal, Black Tom. That means you picked the fight with me. Uh, and Black Tom's like, teach him a lesson, Kane, but don't kill him. And, uh, Juggernaut says, no promises. That's when Angel grabs Black Tom and smashes him into the ceiling. And Iceman's trying to freeze up Juggernaut, but he breaks out of the ice and he says, What's with you guys? You look like kids again, like you did when, when I first met you. Is this another one of those de-aging situ situations? Or are you maybe just trying to get a fresh start? Well, there ain't no such thing as a redo, not after what you did. I might let some of you live, but Scotty Boy gets his head pulped. Why is he all angry with uh, Cyclops, Charlie? Um, I don't know. What did he do? He says, you killed Xavier. You killed my brother. I'll oh. tag you for what you've done. Yeah, that one. Yeah. And, well, you know, yeah. And, oh, is yeah saying, and actually, that was, an intro, that was one of those, like, wasn't Juggernaut being a good guy for a little while there? Yeah. Yeah, I think, what was it, like the early 2000s? Yeah. He was working with the X-Men. Yeah. Yeah, but, but now, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, but Cyclops is like, I get why you're angry, Juggernaut, but you got the wrong guy. That was somebody else, somebody I'll never be. And Juggernaut's like, save it for St. Peter, pal. And Black Tom's trying to get up, and he's like, you've gone and done it, a lot of you. And Jean Grey puts him to sleep with her power. She says, oh, shut up. <laughs> what is Black Tom's power set again? Um, It's, uh, well, he, he, he blasts through that, what, stick he has. It says he's a thermokinetic blaster. A rogue with a oh, rogue. Okay. <laughs> she, 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 she shoots ray beams out of his shillelagh because Marvel. <laughs> hey, this is the fam this is the family show. <laughs> <So what happened? laughs> shillelagh. It means it's a it's an Irish. I walking. know. I know. I don't even know why you would go there. I was going to make a comment about uh, Marvel and their use of ethnic stereotypes in the all new X Men to show diversity. Um, because we've got a Christian and an Irishman. That's <laughs> diversity. Um, yeah, because he, he's uh, Banshee's brother, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Yes. Uh, or their cousin. Uh, maybe their cousins, I think. Yeah, they're related somehow. Yeah, I thought they were brought. Yeah, they're related. Maybe, so. Mm -hmm. so Chuggernaut, Chuggernaut's chasing Cyclops. Cyclops is just running down the yacht, and Iceman's like, "Keep running!" Iceman uh, ices up the deck. Juggernaut falls off. Uh, like Scott jumps overboard, and Juggernaut falls over, and but Angel catches uh, Cyclops, but Juggernaut sinks in the water. And they're like, yeah, sink like a stone. And Jean Grey's like, you don't think he can swim, can you? Which is when he smashes his way back up through the boat. So now the boat's taking on water. Uh, and he's like, the boat's going down and you're going down with it. And they're like, what are we going to do? And Beast says, let, let me try something. He says, this guy might remember the X-Men, but he doesn't remember us. So... Beast uses his new magical power. Charlie opens a portal. All these like tentacles and hands reach up and pull Juggernaut in. And oh. yeah, Cyclops is like, what did you do? He says, did you just send him to hell? And Beast's like, he, you know, we couldn't handle him. So I sent him away. Uh, and Cyclops says, we're X-Men. What if someone saw this would spoil everything we've accomplished so far? And, uh, and B says, this isn't some PR stunt. That guy was endangering people, including uh, including you. He says, I didn't send them to hell. I sent them to Siberia with a short de detour through hell. <laughs> uh, hey, is he still the avatar of Sidorak, or is, is he no longer the avatar of Sidorak anymore? Uh, I don't know. Well, I know for a while. I know, I know Colossus you know. was for a while, and then... Mm -hmm. But then Colossus was dead, and now Colossus is alive again, so... I would assume he is, because, I mean, it seems like he had all his unstoppable power, so... And Jean Grey couldn't uh, penetrate that helmet, so... Well, 
Was yeah. that magical so, or was that just because the helmet was funky? Hmm. Well, the, the helmet is magical because he gets the helmet mm-hmm. from the from the sidetrack. So, yeah. So, mm-hmm. Elder got sidetracked. He ain't messing around. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, okay. No, so we're going to assume he's back being the avatar of Sidorak again. Although I know Sidorak yeah. gets mad when he doesn't smash things enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so the, the, you know, the X-Men are helping the hostages and everyone's at. People are asking Jean Grey, are you Kitty Pride or are you the Scarlet Witch? <laughs> uh, so they they help everyone there. Then they, I guess they their new base is in Madripoor because they fly back to Madripoor. Uh, yeah, sure. And they're talking about, you know, they're talking about their new mission. They're like, uh, speaking of, it's they're talking, and they're like, speak- <laughs> yeah, they're like, speaking of weirdness yeah. and acquired taste, let's go report to the boss. They, they're telling somebody Black Tom has been brought to heal. We turned him over to the, to the authorities in Italy, and we brought him down publicly, just like you wanted. And the figure says, excellent. That's one, but there will be so many more to go. You must be ever vigilant. X Men, threats against mutant kind, comrades who have lost their way, mutants who capitalize on the fears of the populace. You have been chosen, you, the earliest incarnation of Charles Xavier's dream, to ensure that his dream becomes reality, and I will guide you. Do you remember who they said it was, Charlie? Uh, no, actually, I don't know who the leader of X Men, of this group of X Men, is. Ah, uh, they're working with Magneto. Oh, of course. Mm-hmm. Speaking of people who should be dead by now. <laughs> I know! <laughs> he was alive in World War II. How old is this guy? Yeah. Well, I guess now he was a kid in World War II. Because, you know, originally he was actually like a grown up man in World War II, and it was like his wife who died in the concentration camp. And now it's like yeah. his mom. So it's, it's like sliding time. Yeah, uh, uh, that's okay. <sighs> but uh, sounds a, good though. There's a backup, but there's a backup story. Oh, Ooh, a backup story. Did they charge you an extra buck for this book? Um, yes. Or was that just? Oh, they did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's a bunch of hunters in. Uh, oh, does it say where it's at? I'm assuming it's Canada. Well, yeah, it got to be Canada, I think, because uh, there's these hunters and they're. They're hunting down the Wendigo. Because yes, that's smart. Mm-hmm. But then, but then a uh, a figure in a uh, in a hoodie uh, shows up, and he pops his claws, schnicked, and oh, his yes. hood comes down. It looks like it looks like a blonde bearded guy. Yeah, you know and who I that is. Theory. Right? Is that? Here's my theory. I thought is it. In the Ultimate Universe, that Wolverine had a son. Could that be him? That is him. I, th- I think it's a. I think he. Yeah, that was a blonde guy. Yeah, yeah. I think his name yeah. was James. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah. C- CBR actually uh, <laughs> gave that whole reveal. Yes, he is uh, Wolverine's son from the Ultimate Universe. Mm-hmm. So he is uh, Ultimate or Secondary Ultimate Wolverine. Um. There was some theory that it might have been Dakin brought back from the dead, but it's actually another person like Miles from that Ultimate Universe who's been brought for brought over. Um, yeah, that's what, which that's again, what I figured. Cause, yeah, he, he, yeah, because yeah, it looks like I said it looks like a blonde guy, and I I think pretty sure the son was blonde. And yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, we have Miles Morales, and you know, read that the Ultimate Reed Richards, the maker, so. He, of course, it's yeah. that, that version of Wolverine. Yeah, son. that was actually something but, uh, that was yeah. confusing me for a while in the Ultimate Universe because I kept on seeing blonde Wolverine. I was like, "Why is Wolverine blonde in the Ultimate Universe?" Well, because they looks well, they killed old Wolverine and brought his son in. Oh, they killed old Wolverine in the Ultimate Universe. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, I did not know him, the but, Ultimate yeah. Wolverine died. Hmm. I never really read the Ultimates. There was no MC2, mm-hmm. that's all I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that was good. It was a um, thumbs up. Like I said, it's my pick of the week. Uh, the X-Men books are getting good. Hopefully they keep this quality up. Like I said, last week with X-Men Gold, I mean, they've been... I'm hopeful about the X-Men like I haven't been in a long time. Yes. Although we will talk about X-Men Gold 
and super connectivity this super week. Connectivity, yes. All oh. right, let's get to our last book, Charlie, and I'm sure it's your pick of the week. Oh, uh, it did wind up being my pick of the week, and um, I wasn't 100% it was, it was close sure. With me too. In- it's a good book. Um, the yes. base. Oh, I'm trying to remember what you call this. Um, an epistolary. It's an epistolary, which means the entire story is told to some extent through a letter. Um, yeah, and it's very night neat because you see. Actually, this is kind of what's kind of weird about it because you actually open up and you see Misty. There's an image on the computer screen that says Misty with an arrow pointing down at a piece of paper. Because rather than just yes. writing something on the screen and leaving it up for Misty to read, he wrote it on a piece of paper. And then to make sure that she didn't miss it, he put a image on his computer screen. And it's basically, you know, um, uh, Sam Wilson giving his story about Cap, about, um, you know, and... And, you know, how he is this one guy he trusts. And now, this is what is interesting to me in this. Um, You know, it's this interest that we've seen with the Steve Rogers, Captain America in this, where Steve Rogers, as Steve Rogers told Red Skull last week, you know, um, you know, he is, he knows that his past has been manipulated. He knows Mm -hmm that Kobik did this. But he also knows he's still the same man. He is still this man who wants to do right. Now, yes, he wants to do right through Hydra, but you get this great little interstitial here of Cap talking to the guy who runs the Americops and Harry Hauser who is shoving his face full of something. Looks like shrimp, maybe. I'm hoping that shrimp, unless it's, I don't know. I mean, unless he's eating like an actual rat here. I don't know. Um, cause I'm looking, I noticed that there's something in his mouth as he's talking. And it, it does not look like food. I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> But you basically have Cap basically telling the guy who runs Americops, you know, look, I really liked the Americops. I liked the idea that you wanted to establish a police force to deal with rampant crime. But then he says, but you crossed the line because you made this about making money and gentrifying areas and harassing people rather than just being tough on crime. Which is an interesting take on things because, you know, one of the one of the aspects of um, of what you might call uh, fascism is that many people who embrace fascism embrace it on purely noble ideas. They embrace mm. it on the idea that you know um, we need to have order. We need to you know we need to be preemptive and and aggressive about what we have to do. We need to take care so of the people the who are safe. criminals. Yeah, we need to make the world safe. Um, and it, but of course, this gives us a nice dichotomy that one of the problems with that is that you can have this noble idea of of fascism. You you can have that benevolent dictator uh, idea. But that so often the people who are below the benevolent dictator maybe are corrupt and evil who will exploit fascism for its own rewards. But here we have Captain America thinking he is enough of a Captain America to keep everything ordered and structured so that nobody gets hurt. I wonder how well that's going to work out for him. (laughs) Uh, he does kill the guy, and uh, you know Harry Hauser, who is happy to be his his uh, propaganda minister, is more than happy to say, "Hail Hydra!" Um, of course, of course, he's Hydra. Everyone's Hydra if you're a friend of Cap. You know that's the thing. It's like I'm still waiting for Sharon Carter to say, "Hail Hydra!" I'm waiting for those two at the end of the day. Uh, to, I, in fact, I tell you what. 
Secret Empire number zero or number one, the end of the day is Cap coming home to Sharon after they both had a real hard day and they cuddle up on the couch really? to watch some Netflix and they each said and Cap looks at her and says, Hail Hydra. And she says, Hail Hydra. You know You think just, she's in on it? You think she's in on it? Oh, I know she's in on it. Because that's the thing, man. Hydra and Shield are the two as as Baron Baron um was that no, that was as as uh Strucker said in Civil War. Or no, sorry, in uh was that Age of Ultron? No, that wasn't Age of Ultron. That was that was the uh, uh, post credit scene in Winter Soldier. As Baron Strucker said, you know, Shield and Hydra are two sides of the same coin that is no longer valued as currency. You know, um, yeah, I think she's totally on it. He was an interesting thing that I had not put together until just this moment. Gideon. Sam's brother is Gideon from the Gamma Squad. Hmm. Yeah. Because you have uh, Duffy, you know, doing the heavy lifting, and you hear Gideon say, man, I wish when I used to... I I remember when I used to have super strength. That was awesome. Um, (laughs) Then you see poor Rage all up in, in the hospital, breathing on machines. You see Jaquin the Falcon not being cool with anything. They were go- they were going to be a team, man. They were going to be teen superheroes like Power Man and Iron Fist, but cooler. And uh, that isn't going to happen. And Jaquin flies away. And you have Sam. You know, and I love as he's doing this whole thing and he's giving his whole speech. You know. About why he did what he did. Honestly, it is really beautiful. It is a beautiful... Listen, folks, go to your comic book store. If you didn't pick up Sam Wilson, Get the America, pick it up. Because it is a beautifully written story. It's talky. Yes. I'm not going to deny that it's talky. But, man, you know what? Read a book that's talky. Once in a... It's a comic book that's talky. Okay? There's pictures, too. <laughs> I know it's talky, but it is worth it. And there's this great moment here with this young kid who has the rage face paint put on. And then he gets the bazit. He hears um, the last three lines of uh, Sam's statement. <laughs> well, that's how they present it. But you assume he gets into the whole thing. Uh, which is, And his last lines are, whoever comes next. And you see him rinse his face. And then we see he's got artist drawing of Patriot with his Captain America and Falcon books, mm-hmm. um, which is uh, he's so he's got a new hero. Now, is he the Patriot? Because the Patriot looked like a grown up man in the images we've seen. So I don't know if he's the Patriot. That's what or... it look. Yeah, that's what it I looked like. Unless something... he has something, yeah. Well, you know, I wonder if maybe he's perfected the rage formula kind of a, a thing where he know he's he's enough of a nerd that he knows how the rage got big and he's going to be sort of the Shazam of uh, the Marvel Universe now where he does something and he gets big and like I'm in just seven days. He is a man and he can be a superhero. And then we see Falcon fly off. After Misty goes to find out what's going on, and we see the shield and the Captain America accoutrement. Kept the wings, though. Uh, the shield and, and, and everything uh, put away. And we see Sam Wilson looking like um, uh, Mackie uh, in next week's, in next month's issue. Um, looking forward to that. And apparently he teams up with the Wasp. It looks like Janet Van Dyne, so that'll be cool. And a bunch of Inhumans. So, um... Yeah, absolutely pick of the week. Big thumbs up for Cap- Sam Wilson, Captain America. I wonder what they're going to call the rest of the book. Is it going to be still Sam Wilson, Captain America? Is it just going to be Sam Wilson? I don't think hmm. they're going to start renumbering it because they're not announcing it as being renumbered, but he's clearly not Captain American anymore. Now he's just Sam Wilson. Mm-hmm. I mean, he does have a flag with him, so maybe they are still going to call it Captain America, but it's kind of... Uh... Kind of interesting there. So, but he is, he is, oh, huh. 
I wonder if in humans are going to start becoming more like the Morlocks. Because they're in an abandoned mm. subway tunnel, man. Morlocks mm. almost. So let's move in there. But yeah, no, this this book is good. Like I said, it was close to my pick of the week. I recommend everyone go pick it up. But like, I was just disappointed. If that kid's our new is the Patriot, I was kind of disappointed that it's like a brand new character. I was hoping for like somebody already around, like Isaiah Bradley. Well, yeah, yeah. I was really well. I mean, I was actually thinking it was the previous Patriot. Um, uh, mm. I'm forgetting his name again. Um, you know, but uh, oh, from Young Avengers. But- yeah, Bradley's grandson, you know. I thought he was going to yeah, see who it was. Yeah, I was hoping it was one of them, yeah. Because like I said, the last we knew, he was like off in another dimension or something. So he could have been growing up and perfecting the art mm-hmm. of war. But uh, I don't know if this kid is going to be it. Or maybe he's just a guy. Maybe You know, maybe he's going to be the guy who, who helps out whoever it is. You know, we don't know just yet. But he's clearly a sure. super, superhero nerd. And once you have a superhero nerd, all bets are off. Phil, so can I ask you a question? Sure. I had three books this week. Why are we still at an hour and forty-five minutes? Oh, uh, well, we didn't show. hang up. We, we didn't hang up after. Or, or wait, did we? Oh wait, <laughs> yeah, we did. I don't know because we like to talk. <laughs> we do like to talk. Sliding time. Oh my That's goodness! Our sliding Slide time every week. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> anyway, All right, shall we wrap it up? Yes. Um, you've heard a lot of things here today, as we just said. Um, and once again, as we say every week, we don't cover all the books. So if you would like to be a Stockton Piner and uh, send us a review, you can always send those to us via email, marvelroundup at gmail.com. Uh, Give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash all new Marvel Roundup. On Twitter, we are at Marvel underscore Roundup. We're even on Instagram, Marvel Roundup. And Charlie, where can people discuss uh, the physics of the Marvel Universe with you? Well, you can always write to me in the old fashioned email way uh, at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word at gmail.com. If you don't know how to spell superconnectivity, uh, go check out the next podcast, which is the Super Connectivity Podcast. You might like it. Um, Scroll down. <laughs> and of course, if you'd like to follow me on the Twitter, I live tweet all sorts of things from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as best as I can, because I'm always falling asleep by 10 o'clock. It's, I'm old. I'm an old man. Or Powerless, which is soon going off the air. Or something else. Maybe even Legends of Tomorrow, even though I'm not on that podcast anymore. Follow me on the Twitters at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-S-S-E-R. Look for those two E's right there in the middle for the quality. All right. And as for me, you can always uh, talk, discuss anything Marvel or DC with me, NightwingPDP at gmail.com. On Twitter, I am at NightwingPDP. And check out all the other fine works of me and my friends here on Legends of DC, Before the Bat, Channel 52. Check out Charlie Esser on 80s Reboot Overdrive. Uh, But you can find all my stuff at philparents.wordpress.com. All right. I guess that's it. Charlie, that's all? That's all I got. All right, everyone. Come back next week. Uh, We'll entertain you once again with Tales from the Marvel Universe. Because, hey better than sitting home with your shillelagh all day. <laughs> <laughs>